Hello, please take your seats, everyone. It's time for our guest speaker. Shh. Everyone, please find your way back to your seats. Oh, I know, you haven't seen each other in ages. It's, we've got to get together for coffee. Let's uh, meet up and talk about that. Everybody, please find your way back to your seats. Thank you very much. ribbons are there in the room? How many pink ribbons? What I want you to do, I know they're stuck on your lapel. I'd like everyone to hold up their pink ribbons, please. We're going to do a group photograph of your pink ribbons. Hold them high, hold them proud. Thank you, thank you, thank you for your support. I'll do a selfie. We've got our photographer up here. Pink ribbons. One, two, three. Yeah. Thank you very much. A big round of applause to all of you who have supported West Coast Leaf with your pink ribbon campaign. Awesome. I am very, very pleased now to introduce our sponsor who is going to be introducing our guest speaker. Stephanie Smith is representing the presenting sponsor, BCGEU. Stephanie is serving her second term as president of the BC Government and Service Employees Union. She was first elected May 2014, re-elected last year. The first elected women president of the union, which represents more than 74,000 members at more than 550 different employers and BC government ministries. The BCGEU's membership, two-thirds women. Immediately prior to becoming president, Stephanie served as the union's treasurer for three years. Prior to that, she sat on the union's provincial executive, bargaining committee member, representing BCGEU members in the community social services sector. Stephanie is an early childhood educator by training. She began her working life in New Zealand before moving back to Canada. Her involvement with the labour movement began in 1981. Stephanie is a strong advocate for progressive social causes with a focus on community living, young workers, youth at risk, women's services, equity-seeking groups, Indigenous family services, and vulnerable families. My pleasure to welcome BCGEU President Stephanie Smith. Good morning, everyone. Um, you know, I look forward to this event each and every year. It's so wonderful to see such a large room of people here supporting West Coast Leaf, and thank you, Gloria, so much for that lovely introduction. My union, the BCGEU, is actually one of BC's fastest growing unions. Um, we still have officially on our website over 74,000 members, but uh, according to our treasurer, who's been crunching numbers, I think we're closer to 76,000 at this point. And, um, you know, we're strong in our commitment to fight for women's equality in the workplace, within our union, and in the community. And in recent years, we've actually focused much of our organizing efforts on industries that are predominantly female, such as uh, independent health care, uh, within community social services, and somewhat within the hospitality industry, because we know that a strong collective agreement can improve the lives of working women. And we also represent women in a number of non-traditional jobs, like corrections, sheriff services, highways maintenance, and many, many more. And in, in fact, BCGU women are in just about every sector of our economy. Thanks 
to all of our unions, thousands of BC women have realized gains that include job security, a livable wage, pensions, health care plans, all benefits negotiated by their union memberships. And of course, we're extremely delighted to have a government that is now investing in people and in reality, <laughs> yeah, well, sure, I think applause is, is absolutely okay. But in fact, I, I would argue that they are investing in women and vulnerable communities in things like affordable housing, reinvesting in legal aid, and finally, investing in childcare. And of course, our union strongly believes that it is vitally important for us to partner with community organizations just like LEAF that are going to improve the lives of all women, not just those who are lucky enough to have a union. And it's an honor for me today to introduce our keynote speaker, Robin Doolittle. Robin is an award-winning journalist who, after nearly a decade reporting for the Toronto Star, joined the Globe and Mail's investigative team in 2014. Robin's research and reporting of former Toronto Mayor Rob Ford's troubled personal life won the 2014 Michener Award. Her book on the subject, Crazy Town, The Rob Ford Story, was a national bestseller. At the Globe, Robin's unfounded investigation into how Canadian police services handle sexual assault cases has resulted in a national overhaul of policy, training, and practices around sexual assault. Police services are now vowing to review like tens of thousands of previously closed cases. And we're so glad that she's here with us today. Please join me in welcoming Robin Doolittle. Hi, good morning, everyone. That is uh, wonderful news that babies are allowed in the legislature. I was living in my little Ontario bubble yesterday and didn't hear that. Um, my eight-month-old is at the front, so if you hear screaming, it's probably, it's either my husband who's holding the baby or the baby. Um, so I've used, as you have heard, uh, I'm Robin Doolittle and I'm an investigative reporter with the Globe and Mail. I'm here today to speak with you about my unfounded series. It was an investigation into how Canadian police services handle sexual assault cases and it was 20 months in the making. I can tell you that when I began working on the story in the summer of 2015, I, of course, had no idea how much the landscape was about to shift in this area. Since Unfounded was published just a little over a year ago, we've seen Harvey Weinstein exposed as a serial predator. We've seen Me Too. We've seen Time's Up. Now there's a global rethink going on about how women are being treated. It started out as a discussion about sexual violence and then shifted to sexual misconduct, sexual harassment, and now it's expanded to a broader discussion about how society values women. The lingering pay gap, the lack of female CEOs, the lack of women uh, board members and elected officials. Whether it's unfounded or Me Too or diminished female voices in the workplace, all of these ills are dredged from the same pool of misogyny. I'm here today, today to talk to you about one small piece of that discussion. And the good news is, there's good news. I first began working on Unfounded in the summer of 2015. At the time, the Gomeshi trial was dominating headlines and I felt like no matter where I went in the city, I kept encountering the same conversation over and over and over again. That the justice system was failing sexual assault victims. It made me wonder if there was something I could take on from an investigative standpoint in this area. 
Because the idea that the system is failing sexual assault victims is not a new one. And as many have pointed out before, it's not surprising that this long, broken, and long, unfixed area of the legal system disproportionately impacts female victims. But the complaints that we hear are always rooted in an anecdote. A particularly egregious story makes headlines, there's an onslaught of outraged columns, people demanding change, and then the story fades, and so does the calls for change, until the next egregious story makes the headlines, and then the cycle st starts all over again. I wanted to find something specific and concrete that couldn't be dismissed as a one-off. After doing some research, I came across a small study by a University of Ottawa professor into this issue called unfounded rates. It was a concept I'd never heard about before. And basically what it is is that when a police officer finishes any criminal investigation, they give it a code to signify the meaning. One of those codes means we've charged somebody. One of those codes means this crime didn't happen. That's what unfounded is. It's the officer does not believe a violation of the law occurred or was attempted. And what my investigation showed is that every year, Canadian police were dismissing one out of every five sexual assault complaints as unfounded. This is nearly twice the rate at which physical assault cases are dismissed in a similar way. And it's dramatically higher than the actual false reporting rate which important and scholarly studies on three different continents have shown is somewhere between two and eight percent. This is important. Unfounded cases are not the same thing as when police don't have enough evidence to lay a charge, and unfounded cases are not cases where they just simply can't find the suspect. They mean, you said you were raped, and I don't think you were raped. And when I say one in five sexual assaults are being dismissed as unfounded, that's just the average. Through hundreds of freedom of information requests, I obtained data from 873 police jurisdictions across the country over a five-year period ending in 2014. In total, 115 Canadian communities were found to be dismissing at least a third, that's one in three, sexual assault complaints as unfounded. And in some communities, it was more than half of all complaints. And here's the thing. If police are improperly dismissing sex assault allegations as baseless, there are serious consequences from a policy standpoint, never mind the impact on public trust. Once a case is designated unfounded, it is no longer considered a valid, a valid accusation. And before my investigation, was essentially scrubbed from the public record as if it was never reported at all. It's not sent to Statistics Canada for the annual crime indicator release, which, makes, which policymakers rely on to make, to make evidence-based decisions on law enforcement and victim services budgets and resources. To bring a human face to the data in my investigation, I also looked into 54 specific cases of sexual assault reported to police. In looking at those cases, I was not trying to prove one way or another whether the incident occurred. I was simply focusing on how the police handled the alleged offense. And what I found is that while sexual assault is one of the most serious crimes in the criminal code, perhaps second only to homicide, these investigations were being neglected, regardless of whether the case itself was thrown out as unfounded. I found evidence that basic investigative steps, such as identifying and interviewing witnesses, obtaining video surveillance, taking crime scene photos, collecting and reviewing forensic evidence, even questioning the suspect, these things were routinely being skipped. Further, I found repeated evidence that some police officers whose sole job it is to investigate sexual assault are misinformed about Canadian consent law, particularly as it relates to a person's ability to consent to sexual activity while they're severely intoxicated, and the fact that in this country, we have an affirmative consent standard, meaning that a person has to indicate that yes, they would like to engage in sexual activity. They don't need to say no, they don't need to fight back for it to be rape. 
I found evidence that some officers tasked with investigating sexual assault were not familiar with the neurobiology of trauma, how trauma can impact a person's actions during an attack, as well as their ability to recount it after the fact. I spoke to a young woman named Ava, who told me that when she walked into the London Police Service to report that she had been raped at a university keg party while in and out of consciousness, um, because she had been so drunk, she felt scared but strong. She wanted justice, but when she emerged from that interview, she felt ashamed, confused, and full of guilt. During the interview, the detective questioned Ava about why her clothing was ripped. He suggested to her repeatedly that perhaps what happened actually had been consensual. He told her they located her underwear and that there was discharge on it, suggesting she had biologically consented. The detective falsely told her that it wasn't possible for her to remember some parts of the night, but not others. I spoke to a teenager named Maddie, who in October 2015 told an investigator in Timmins, Ontario that she had been raped by a male at a party. Before the female officer asked Maddie a single question about the alleged assault, she told the teenager that her job was to find a solution to a problem and being charged and having a criminal record isn't always a solution. It might be a stern talking to. About 30 minutes into the interview, the officer stops Maddie to tell her that she has made a decision. Quote, I think there may have been an under, a misunderstanding on his end, believing that there was consent. A person who is highly intoxicated cannot give consent, but my only concern is that it sounds like he was intoxicated at the same time. So I think educating him is a good thing, but I think educating you is a good thing too, because you have to take a little bit of responsibility as well, right? And you know, you unfortunately drank too much. These cases were not outliers. At this point, the constable has not questioned the suspect or anyone else from the party. This is 30 minutes into a single interview. If you're noticing a pattern of all the individual sex assault complaints that I investigated, 18 of them involved alcohol. These stories struck me particularly hard on a personal level because whenever I interviewed an Ava or a Maddie, my own teen and university years cycled through my mind. One particular night when I was 18 really sticks out. I'd moved to Toronto from a really small town in southwestern Ontario to attend university. I joined the varsity figure skating team, and back then, universities were still having rookie nights. For figure skaters, this means dressing up in a 1990s style spandex skating dress and having the seniors feed you countless shots and smear your face in glitter and lipstick. Armed with a fake ID, we piled into cabs and headed to the entertainment district in Toronto. At some point, I got separated from my friends and find myself, found myself back outside on the street without my wallet or my phone or a coat or any idea where I was or how to get home. The bouncer wouldn't let me back in. A cab driver pulled up and offered to take me to my residence free of charge. He pushed open the passenger side door. I got in and pre pretty soon his hand was on my leg. I don't remember much of the drive, but I do remember the moment when I realized he was driving past my university residence. He told me how pretty I was. I knew I was in trouble, but I didn't want him to know that I knew that. I smiled and thanked him and told him how grateful I was that he was helping me out and that I'd love to spend some time with him, but I was so uncomfortable in my skating dress and felt silly with all the makeup on, and would he be willing to let me go upstairs and change first? I don't remember exactly what he said, but he turned around and brought me to my residence. I promised I'd be right back. On the elevator up to my room, I, mem I remember thinking, wow, that was a close one. Later on, I would tell this as a hilarious story. It was so much easier to think of it as a funny near miss rather than as terrifying. So like I said, these incapacity stories really stuck with me on a personal level. It truly wasn't until Unfounded that I realized it was through some sheer luck that I hadn't found myself in the same situation as Ava or Maddie. I'm also fascinated by the legal challenges around these cases. We have laws that someone who does not understand the risks and consequences of their action cannot consent to sexual activity. But pinning down when that line is crossed is extremely difficult for both officers and the court system. 
And yet, sexual assault nurse examiners who must make decisions about a patient's capacity to consent to an exam after an assault say it's pretty clear. I interviewed Sheila McDonald, the clinical manager of the Sexual Assault Domestic Violence Care Center. She told me, it's talking with someone and then asking, can you repeat back to me what, you just, what we just talked about? Or she'll ask a question and can they answer it? She said, people that are outright staggering, slurring their words, tuning out, lack of focus, tired, hard to wake up, etc., are not engaged in the conversation and they cannot consent. I wrote about these issues in a piece entitled, How Alcohol Complicates Sexual Assault Cases. The story highlighted two particular cases, one involving a woman called K.S. who was raped after a night out in the entertainment district with friends. In that case, the Toronto police did everything right. The case went to court and he was convicted. In the other case, a 21-year-old from a small town named Taylor, her case never went anywhere. Taylor told police she was raped by a man she met at a bar after a night of heavy drinking. She said she was in and out of consciousness, consciousness during the incident. Taylor theoretically did everything next that a quote, real victim of sexual assault does. When she woke up and found the man on top of her, as soon as he left the room, she got up, grabbed her purse, and then sprinted out of the house, leaving her shoes behind. As she ran down the street, screaming for help, she phoned her brother. Her mother met her and they went straight to the hospital where she consented to a sexual assault exam. But my investigation showed that the officer tasked with looking into this case didn't seem to understand blood alcohol results. She concluded that Taylor's levels did not support her story that she could be so drunk that she passed out. And I spoke to two of Ontario's leading experts on this who said that they absolutely did. It ran on March 7th, this story ran on March 17, 2017, and by that point, the Unfounded series had been running every day in the paper for about a month and a half. Given this, I was not at the least bit <laughs> expecting the onslaught of reader emails that I received about this latest installment. I'll read you a few of the highlights. Should the victims not be held responsible for putting themselves at risk through their irresponsible behavior? Just to be clear, I do not condone sexual assault in any form, but I think much more has to be done about educating people about alcohol, drug abuse, and the consequences. I can't help but wonder why young women expose themselves to such situations. I'm not suggesting she deserves what she gets. I'm just suggesting that this sort of behavior may not be very smart and that the victim should bear some responsibility for being so stupid. As a 42-year-old man, I can tell you that I would not even want to have sex with a drunk woman. <laughs> but I think a woman also has responsibilities when it comes to sexual assault. You can't just go around blaming men for everything. I think there will always be a hormonal and biological difference between men and women. <laughs> we can do that. Let's just, let's just all collectively... Okay, all right. Most of the emails I received were prefaced with declarations of open-mindedness and variations on the comment, please don't mis misunderstand me and think I'm victim blaming. But all of these emails veered in the same direction. Why are these women not culpable? By this rationale, I have deserved to have been raped more than a dozen times in my life. I'm not advocating for people to get blackout drunk. I'm not saying that I behaved super smart when I was a teenager in university. Uh, or, or some late high school. I, <laughs> early high school, okay. Uh, I made my share of stupid decisions, just like my male friends, but just like my male friends, I should pay for it the same way, with a hangover and depleted bank accounts. It's imperative that those who work in, okay, we can clap for hangovers, clap for hangovers. <laughs> It's imperative that those who work in law enforcement and the judiciary have an enlightened opinion on rape mythology and stereotypes. It's imperative that they understand consent law, that yes means yes, and no means no, and I'm not sure means no, and I've changed my mind means no, and that someone getting drunk with their friends at a party does not equal consent to sex. But police and crowns and judges are people too. <laughs> Clap for the first part, yeah. <laughs> And what I've learned is that even those among us who consider themselves to be one of the good guys in this fight harbor many of the same prejudices that they denounce without even realizing it. This is why the conversation we're having now with Me Too and Time's Up is so critical. 
From a policing perspective, logically, when everyone is struggling with budget cuts and limited resources, why would you invest extra time in a sexual assault investigation if some part of you thinks, yeah, but why did she put herself in that position? Change comes with changed attitudes. That's why one of the most important uh, important and heartening things to come out of the unfounded investigation is that as of now, half of Canadians are being policed by a service that will be introducing new, specialized, sexual assault, trauma-informed training for its officers. At the beginning of this talk, okay, there's lots more to applaud if you're feeling depleted here. I, there's lots of good news about this. At the beginning of this talk, I said there would be good news, and in this era, area, there actually is. The Unfounded series launched on February 3rd, 2017, and spanned more than 50 stories, the last of which ran in December. In the past year, in response to the Globe's reporting, at least 100 police services across Canada have committed to going over and reviewing previously closed cases. To date, more than 30,000 cases are being audited. About half of those were closed as baseless. Of those that have been reviewed so far, police say a third of the unfounded cases should not have been dismissed in this way. 400 files have been reopened. I know of at least a handful of charges, although I've also been told I can't be told this because it might jeopardize the prosecution. So think about that. Someone has been arrested in a case that police say didn't happen. Thousands of cases are being reopened, or are being recoded. Ren, I'm almost done, I'm sorry. <laughs> moreover, moreover, in addition to training reforms, half of the country is now being policed by a police, services, by a police service that has adopted an oversight model that the Globe wrote extensively about. It's called the Philadelphia model, and in that city, it has seen dramatic success. The Philadelphia model entails civilian violence against women uh, workers being given access to raw police files to review once a year for signs of bias and investigative missteps. And since that program has been in place in the last 17 years, the city's unfounded rape for rape cases has dropped from 18% to 4%. Finally, last year, the federal government announced $100 million to combat gender-based violence, citing the Globe's investigation. And you're seeing similar investments from provinces across the country. This is only the beginning, and we are a long way away from learning where these re whether these reforms will actually improve the situation for victims of sexual violence. But it's a pretty damn good start, and I think proof that we shouldn't be intimidated to go after something that isn't working, no matter how big or untouchable it seems. Thanks very much, everyone. Thank you.